What's going on everyone? Sergeant Arthur here and today we will be reacting to part two of our little series. Battle of MA 272 AD. How Aurelian restored the Roman Empire. Check out part one in the description and also I just did a video about the Roman Empire's like history. Like uh, time lapse of the, of Rome every year, so check that out. It's pretty cool, pretty interesting video to react to. But yeah, without further ado, let's find out how Aurelian restored the German. I mean, <laughs> the Roman Empire. Hey guys, if you missed part hey. one of this mini series, you can find it here. Following the victory over the Goths in the Balkans. The also, by the way, in my last, in my, in my part one, I said, why wasn't the capital behind the mountains of Persia instead of right in the plains? Well, I realize now that was very stupid. Like, yeah, it offers protection, but it's going to be extremely hard to get supplies across the mountains. Like from the capital, so that's why they have it right there, so they can supply their troops really, really easily. Not have to travel across these huge mountains. In fact, right now, Iran has their capital behind the mountains, and that's what made it so difficult for them. In the um, in the Iran Iraq war that happened just recently, like twenty years ago or something. Because Iran had to get all their supplies across the mountains. But at the same time, an ultimate advantage. Because Iraq couldn't penetrate the mountains, so... It ended up being a stalemate. But anyways, I'm getting off topic. The flagging morale of the Roman forces had been restored, and with a restructured nice. Danubian frontier, Aurelian could now must... Yeah, there's like a humongous river called the Danube River. That's why the Roman Empire has such a consistent border here for almost, like, for the later part of its history. The strong field armies for the campaigns ahead, without compromising the empire's security. The emperor wintered in Byzantium, making preparations for the upcoming war with Zenobia, and ensuring that the borders would be protected in his absence. Considerable manpower was allocated to defend the Balkans against the tribes from across the Danube. Troops were stationed in Italy to prevent a possible return of the Alamanni and the Iatungi. And in Narbonese Gaul, a substantial presence of imperial troops was required to guard against the Gallic Empire. By spring 272, Aurelian had mustered his own army in Thrace and had completed all preparations. Zenobia, seeing that war with Aurelian was now inevitable, had her son Vabalathis declared Augustus and had herself proclaimed Augusta, the traditional title of a Roman empress. But because of the Palmarine failure to secure Bithynia, Aurelian was easily able to secure a bridgehead and march into Asia. Nice. He sent a second force to make a naval landing in Egypt under the talented Marcus Aurelius Probus, the future emperor. The logistical planning and execution of this invasion marked Aurelian as one of the greatest military thinkers of the third century AD. His plan was a pincer movement on a massive scale how the heck do you do a pincer movement on that, that, that big of a border? Jeez, that has got to be overstretched. Or very stretched a out. true masterclass in strategic warfare. Oh my gosh, look how big these guys got. All they had was like Syria earlier. And now they literally just conquered everything. That's this crazy. video is brought to you. Does no, thank you. Plus... It. But there are over Danium. You'll lack for a full free one. 
Aurelian's war against Zenobia had two objectives. The first was to recapture those parts of the Empire over which Zenobia had recently established her dominion. The most important of these were the wealthy provinces of Asia Minor, with their significant tax contribution to the coffers of the imperial government, and Egypt, with its vital supply of grain. The Mediterranean area of Syria, but... Yeah, if you think about it, these people literally took some of the most viable land from Rome. Like, wow. Particularly the city of Antioch, was of secondary but still considerable importance. The Emperor's second objective was to eliminate Zenobia and to reduce the power of Palmyra so as to avoid a repeat of this dangerous situation. However, Aurelian knew that Syria would be heavily defended and that a prolonged war there was possible. This would prevent him from reaching Egypt by land, which he urgently needed to recover to secure a steady flow of grain, as well as revenues from the Red Sea trade. This was the main reason for his ambitious naval invasion to open a second front. The Roman fleet reached the Nile Delta sometime in the spring of 272. Very little is known about the campaign itself. Upon making landfall, Probus initially fought with success, but was then nearly captured. Oh, no. The reinforcements helped him gain a foothold against the Palmyrene garrison, and by early June, Alexandria was safely back in Aurelian's control. Dang, nice. Probus then began operations to retake the rest of Egypt. Meanwhile, after crossing into Asia Minor, the advancing Roman column was triumphantly welcomed by the inhabitants of Bithynia, who had successfully resisted Zenobia's domination. In Galatia, any Palmyrene troops stationed there were certainly not numerous enough to stop Aurelian's army, and they quickly withdrew to the southeast, bringing valuable intelligence about Aurelian's uh, why do they have to make an eyeball? It looks so weird. Vance. With the loose no, Palmarine hegemony evaporating before him, the Emperor was welcomed without a struggle by the citizens of Ang- I was actually about to say, like, why weren't the citizens rebelling or something? But... I... I guess they are fine with them. Okay, that's good. Akira, the provincial capital. Dang, that's almost the exact same name as now. After making sure that his supply lines were secure, from here he proceeded southeast towards the Cilician Gates, a cosmic pass through the Taurus Mountains that connected the Anatolian Plateau with the Cilician Plains and Syria beyond. However, before he could reach the pass, his route took him to the town of Tiana in Cappadocia, which was strategically located along the route to Syria. The town refused to open its gates, but Aurelian could not afford to leave a hostile garrison along his lines of supply. Angered, he ordered the city besieged, pledging that he would not leave even a dog alive once the city had fallen. Whoa! Desirous of plunder, what did the dogs ever do? the siege with all the more determination. The machine-like manner with which the Romans slowly choked the city over the course of several weeks spread fear among some sections of the population. With the pressure mounting, Tiana capitulated Jeez. when one of the frightened residents betrayed the city to the Emperor by showing to him a weakness in the wall. The capital of Cappadocia <laughs> was now in the Emperor's hands. But... Aurelian thought better of his previous intention to massacre Tyana. With an insight rare among 3rd century emperors, he realized that sparing the city would set a precedent far more potent in the coming conflict. He ordered his army not to harm Tyana, thus presenting himself to the populace as a liberator rather okay. than a conqueror. But his troops were none too pleased. They expected to be allowed to plunder the city, 
and angrily demanded that Aurelian stand. Stop the steal of what? What? And by his promise, this was indeed a dangerous move. Amidst the heightened political military tensions of the 3rd century, many an emperor and usurper were lynched by their own soldiers for refusing Jeez. plunder. That Aurelian managed to survive this encounter reflects his ability to foster strong relations with his soldiers at a time when armies were prone to rebellion against their commanders. Not allowing himself to be intimidated by his men, the Emperor admitted that he had indeed ordered that no dog in Tiana be allowed to live. Accordingly, he ordered his soldiers to kill all dogs in the city. The anger oh of the gosh. soldiers was dispelled by their laughter at this response. No, I hate how they have like these dumb, like, laughing emojis and like the weird highball earlier and like the weird fighting scenes. But everything else is cool. Like, what the heck? What is this? No. Bonds. Aurelian went on to explain his decision to the troops. We waged war to free these cities. If we pillage them, they will never trust us. This display of sound political judgment showed that he understood that Zenobia was a formidable foe and that he had better chances of defeating her through clemency rather than terror. Hmm. With the capture of Tiana, the way to Syria now lay open. Also, what are these really tiny circles? Like, look right here. What are those? Are those just like, tiny cities or forts? Alien's army marched into Cilicia without resistance, likely passing through Tarsus, the provincial capital, before heading east through Issus, where Alexander the Great had won his famous victory over the Persians. Dang, thanks. From here, the Roman Emperor reached the port of Alexandretta. Although he had gained control over Asia Minor with relative ease, before him now lay Syria, the heartland of oh. Palmarine power. Meanwhile in Egypt, Probus managed to topple the resistance and regain control of the province. He then proceeded to march towards the Levant. He pressed the Palmarines from the south and perhaps secured the loyalty of the Cyrenian third Dang, you seem to do that pretty easily. Third legion in Arabia, which had been previously subdued and its general killed by Zenobia. To address this, Zabdas detached a considerable force in anticipation of Probus's advance on Palmyra. Having lost Alexandria, the Queen now had one remaining mint under her control in Antioch. Oh, Knowing gosh. that this would be Aurelian's first objective in Syria, it was here that she and her generals stationed Palmyra's forces in preparation for the Roman advance. Oh, the Battle of Antioch is going to be interesting. Oh yeah, but it's the Battle of M.A. Where's M.A. again? I don't remember. Aurelian's army consisted of legionary detachments drawn from Raetia, Noricum. Wow, what? Jeez, they conquered all of Asia Minor with 36,000 troops. That is impressive. Like, I know back then armies were small, but like, that's still like a humongous area. Pannonia and Moesia, as well as Praetorians and Moorish and Dalmatian cavalry, who served as elite mounted units. Zabda's army consisted of Palmarines and other Syrians, but also various other Roman units that had declared their loyalty to Queen Zenobia's family. Palmyra. Thanks, so they actually outnumber them. Palmyra's greatest advantage over Aurelian's army was their Ooh. Clebanari, or super heavy cavalry. These Ooh. mounted Ooh. units were better armored and more numerous than Aurelian's Dalmatians and Moors. The Roman Emperor began crossing over the mountains. Or well, maybe they can 
be able to outmaneuver them since these guys have such heavy cavalry. He had received unwelcome reports that the Palmarines lay between him and. What the heck? He had received unwelcome reports. They just like. <laughs> they just disappear? What? They just drown? What just happened there? Reports that the Palmarines lay between him and Antioch. Zabdas drew up his army in the Orontes Plain, on the western side of the Lake of Antioch, to the north of the city. Here, he could intercept Aurelian's advance along the road from Alexandretta, at a narrow point where the flat terrain was especially well suited to the battle tactics of the Palmarine heavy mailed cavalry. However, Aurelian refused to fight Zabdas on the battlefield of his own choosing. Knowing that a direct assault would be to surrender operational and tactical advantage to the enemy, he instead decided to march to the east of the lake, seeking to outflank the Palmarine position. This maneuver had three advantages. First, the Palmarines anticipated a frontal assault from the north and might become confused by an attack from their rear. Second, he would block the enemy's line of retreat to the east, and if he could reach the city, he could also close oh, yeah. off the road leading south. Lastly, the terrain south of the lake was less suited to Zabda's formidable cataphracts. Oops, what the heck? However, the Palmarine general got wind of Aurelian's maneuver. Having all How? They're all over there. Ready stationed a small contingent to guard the road to Baroya, he sent his elite heavy cavalry to bolster their ranks. Oh, he could ill afford to lose his line of retreat, so it was imperative that they intercept Aurelian's army on the plain to the east of the lake before they could reach the hilly terrain further south where his cavalry would be at a disadvantage. The Emperor's scouts soon brought back reports of Palmarine movements. Realizing he had lost the element of surprise, Aurelian led most of his cavalry ahead of the main body of the army. He was well aware of the fearsome reputation of the Klibanari and did not want to risk his infantry against Zabdas's heavy cavalry. Yeah, that would be a bad idea. It was a hot June morning. The Roman Emperor marched at pace well ahead of the rest of the army, with a cavalry contingent of around 5,000 strong, hoping to outflank Zabdas at Antioch. With him, he had the veteran Dalmatian and Moorish light cavalry, which had been under Aurelian's command for a number of years before he became Emperor, serving as the elite cavalry arm of the Roman army. They were a tactically astute branch of the military, capable of executing battle plans across vast distances with precision, and had participated in numerous campaigns, often being the deciding factor in major engagements. However, Aurelian found that his way was blocked by the Palmarine heavily armored oh, cavalry, arrayed on the Antioch Baroya Road. Zabdas's cataphracts were of even better quality than Aurelian's Dalmatians and Moors. These troops had been forged in the fire of the Persian War. What the heck are they gonna do? I don't understand how they're gonna, if, or even if they're gonna win. Like, this seems pretty bad right now. Moors, and perhaps represented the very pinnacle of cavalry warfare in the third century AD. Wow. It is likely that Zabdas fielded up to 5,000 of these troops at Ime, but their exact strength and composition remains unclear. The Palmarines traditionally use light cavalry and dromedary archers, so it is possible that these heavy cavalry units were not local and were in fact cataphracts of the Roman army in the east, which were controlled by Queen Zenobia, Rome employed such units as an answer to Persian cataphracts, and they would have been controlled by Zenobia's husband before he was assassinated. This further confirms that the conflict between Rome and Palmyra 
was in fact a civil war. Despite this, ancient sources descended from Aurelian's propaganda portrayed Palmyra as an external enemy, even though they were an integral part of the empire for centuries. Further evidence of this propaganda can be seen in their portrayal of Zenobia as an e Why are so many weird like Trump references? I don't understand. Eastern barbarian, a foreigner, despite her family having senatorial status. The fact that she was of Syrian descent was clearly used against her by the central imperial government. Aurelian presented Zenobia's son as an illegitimate ruler, but ironically, oh. it was Aurelian himself who lacked senatorial status before he took power. He was an Illyrian general who killed his way to the throne, overthrowing Quintilius, and, according to some sources, he played a role in the assassination of Emperor Gallienus. Aurelian did eventually get senatorial support, but he had earned it through brute force. Likewise, the troops from both armies used to be part of the Roman military before the war. At Ime, the two commanders fielded their best mounted contingents, both understanding the importance of the opening encounter. Around mid-morning, Aurelian gave the signal. On the other end, Zabdas rose to the challenge. What did they expect to do? Undoubtedly, the heavily armored cataphracts were encouraged, seeing the light Dalmatian and Moorish cavalry. Little did they know, are they gonna Aurelian win? was one of the finest cavalry commanders of his time. Oh, okay. Just before the first charge of the enemy, he instructed his men to wheel about and not risk Whoa. close quarters combat with their... Yeah, like I said, like, you know, they're lighter, so they can theoretically outmaneuver them, so... They can use it to their advantage. ...heavier counterparts. The light-armed cavalry feigned retreat, inviting the enemy to give chase. This encouraged the Palmarines to press forward in anticipation of an easy victory. Whenever a minor clash occurred, Aurelian's lighter units would flee. With each charge of Zabdas's cataphracts, the nimble Dalmatians and Moors used their speed to avoid the confrontation and retreat along the main road towards the town of Ime. Oh, and this is going to be the Battle of Ime, okay. The Palmarines pursued the Romans for several... There's only two minutes what left, what the heck? ...kilometers. No. Soon enough, the Syrian midday sun began taking its toll. True to the word, Clebanarius, meaning oh. oven man, the Palmarine Clebanari and their horses suffered in the heat, having maintained the chase in their heavy armor. Aurelian noticed the exhaustion of the enemy. On cue, he turned his cavalry and countercharged the pursuers. Okay, that was... That, okay, this... That is smart, wow. I have never seen something like that before. It's very Taken creative. by surprise, the Clebanari could not put up an effective resistance nor flee their nimble enemy. The slaughter was terrible. The tired, heavy horsemen were either slain in their saddles or thrown off their horses and mangled by the hooves of Jeez. friend and foe. Few managed to escape the carnage and find their way back to Antioch. Aurelian's tactics at Ime relied on the veteran Dalmatian and Moorish cavalry. Their steely discipline, courage, and their ability to coordinate an effective and timely counterattack after retreating a great distance. Their deadly efficiency demonstrated the Emperor's tactical expertise, as well as his experience as a cavalry commander. In one fell swoop, he had dealt a crippling blow to Palmyra's most powerful military asset. No, it doesn't even... It doesn't show the number of casualties. What the heck? Like in the... In the... In the other one, like the Roman... The... The Carthage... 
The Punic Wars one, like it showed the exact, not the exact casualties, but the essayed casualties. Their vaunted, heavily armored cavalry. However, further to the south, the Palmarines still possessed cavalry that far outnumbered those available to the Emperor, including a reserve of cataphracts. Aurelian knew that the battle had by no means secured the defeat of Zenobia's regime, and that the outcome of the war was yet to be decided. Credit goes to our awesome patrons who make videos like this one possible. Consider joining them to. Thank you all for watching, everyone. That was a fun little video. That was on May 8th, so. That was pretty recent. Well. Wow. Yeah, we'll be reacting to part 3 tomorrow. Thank you all for watching, and goodbye. Hello, everyone. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe to my channel. And, you know. Turn on the notification bell thingy. And if you didn't, then make sure to leave a uh, thumbs down. Oh yeah, that would be greatly appreciated. And while you're at it, go ahead and watch my other videos. They're probably just as good, and if not, better than this one right now. Except for my oldest videos, don't watch those. And, you know, subscribe to these people down here, my fellow sergeants. They're other YouTubers that I either know or I have high and high regards. Yeah, even my cat agrees. So, thank you for watching, and have a great day.